so church family, would you pray with me? Let's ask God to bless the preaching of the word. Heavenly Father, in these moments, I ask that you would perform heart surgery, that you do the impossible task of changing our hearts from hearts of stone to hearts that beat for you above all things. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. How selfish are people really? I want you to think about that, and as you do, I wanted to talk about a Harvard Business Review article that I read. In this review, uh, he was referencing the year 1776, and this is the quote I came upon. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Did you get it? In 1776, the observation was the reason that we have food on the table, the reason that people provide great things, is really not because they want to help us, but because they want to make a buck. In fact, this last line reminded me of a sales tactic. You don't really even have to sell anything if you just appeal to their own self-interest. The article went on and it referenced the me decade. If you were to guess the me decade, does anyone know what is described as the me decade? It is the 1970s. So you might have said this decade. The 1970s where people turned their attention uh, from global issues and wars that were going on. They're exhausted about that and said, we just got to focus on ourselves and what's happening in our own lives. 1776, 1970, 2023. How selfish are we really? For me, I know this is a serious topic, so I want to make a little bit light of it. I, I always consider three areas, three areas that I see selfishness. Number one is when you're in the checkout line and you happen to see one line is going faster than yours or you're in a line that now it's blinking and they need like help and you're like, oh my goodness, my world is crumbling. What is going on? Number two, traffic. We're always more concerned about how someone else is driving and why they're not driving like us. We're more concerned about how we need to get there, not how they need to get there. And number three, this is a new one. Are you ready for it? You can test it today. If you're on social media at all, the pictures that people post, go with me here. Do they make the poster look good, the person who put it out there? Or do they make everyone else look good? Because I would tell you, more often than not, the person posting always looks good, and the people around them may not look good. How selfish are people, really? Now, I don't really want to go back there, but do you remember COVID? You remember when it was at its height? It seemed like collectively we, we lost the inability. We, we lost the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Even if we didn't agree with it, it seems there was an inability to go there and understand where they might be coming from. Now, we've come before an almighty God who can peer into the hearts of all people. And if God would answer the question, how selfish are we really, what would his answer be? He knows. He knows how people are in radical pursuit of anything that would benefit them. In fact, what I believe is, is he would recognize this, our first fill-in. That if you're taking notes, he would say that the default setting of your sinful nature of how we were made without Jesus Christ, of the, the hearts of stone that have not been made alive for him, that default is always going to pursue me. But this is why Jesus Christ is so beautiful, so worthy of all praise, so different, so extraordinary. Because what is common for us, he did differently. In fact, perhaps uh, Paul in the book of Philippians put it the best, when it talks about he, how he did this differently. Look at these words about Jesus. He who is in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to use to his own advantage. He didn't make his Godhead about himself. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, 
And being found as an appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus' rescue plan was to die in the worst way. What the Greeks invented and the Romans perfected, crucifixion, that's the way of Jesus Christ for us. And it's why he's beautiful. It's why he's different. But then he's going to tell us, if you are in Christ, by the way, no student is above the master. And what I have done, primarily, yes, for your salvation, but also as your example, you also must do. In fact, here are the requirements of any disciple. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And maybe you've heard that, that as a Christian, we carry a cross as well. And um, I had a great professor, Daniel Deutschlander. Can you tell we have a German background? Daniel Deutschlander. He's now in heaven with the Lord. He's, he's finished the race, friends. Uh, but he was such a great professor. He, he wrote this book called The Theology of the Cross that always sticks with me. And, and he identified what the cross is that we bear as Christians. What do we have to carry? And he put it this way. He said, the essence of the cross in every stage of life, in every changing circumstance is simply this, self-denial. Self-denial. And then I went to men's group, and right now they're doing men's fraternity, Robert Lewis. And Robert Lewis, another theologian, came up with this paradox principle. The paradox principle is this, that in order to live, you must die. To, to truly live, to do it correctly, you must die. And one other reflection. I remember graduating from seminary. You had all the moms and, and grandparents there to hear this inspiring message of sending out the, the new grads into their field of service. And, and the professor got some flack that day. You know why? Because his sermon was this. Prepare to die. All the grandparents came in, all the moms and dads loving their, their little sons and, and their fiancés, prepare to die. But was he wrong? Isn't that exactly what God calls us to do? To put ourselves down so that we might give him glory and serve our neighbor? It is. But this is going to take sacrifice. This isn't easy. This doesn't come naturally. For all of us to put ourselves down and truly take someone else's perspective or serve them, it is hard work. And it was hard for Jesus, too. And so today we're going to learn from his account. Uh, we're in the book of John, chapter 13, and I want to share a little bit about the background of the story. Where we find Jesus today is on Monday, Thursday. And uh, he's already approached Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He is in the upper room, and they're about to celebrate the Lord's Supper. He is establishing that for the first time. And as they've gathered, um, he's going to do something that only a slave would do. He's going to do something that uh, you would do for yourself if a bowl of water was set out. In a day of travel, uh, you needed to wash your feet. That was your main modus of, of getting somewhere. And, uh, and this is his example for us all. Uh, so we're going to take in John chapter 13. For some, it's very familiar words. It's a longer account, so feel free to stay seated. Uh, it's in your worship folder, your Bibles, or on the screen, whatever your preference is. Let's hear this. So it was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved those who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? <laughs> Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. But Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Well, then Lord Simon Peter replied, 
not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. At this point, I wonder if Jesus is frustrated. Just, could you just go along with me, Peter, please? Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. This may be a reference to conversion and that he was already baptized. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. That's a reference to Judas, who would betray him. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that's why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked him. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash the feet of another. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very I tru truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So the powerful words we get to consider. Could you say out louder to someone next to you, you will be blessed if you do them? You will be blessed if you do them. We're going to talk about that and its difference. All right. I don't know if you heard of this lady making the news, this lady who was popular in Full House and Fuller House. Does anyone know the scandal that she was involved in? If not, let me remind you. Uh, she was involved in a college bribery scandal. She had two daughters that she wanted to send to USC, and so she gave a half a million dollars to this organization in the form of donations, and uh, said that they were gonna row crew even though they've never rowed crew before, as a way to get in that college. Now, obviously, this was found out. Uh, she was convicted. She was actually sentenced to a couple months in prison. But the reason I bring this up is because it's an example of what many people are tempted to do with their power, with their platform. And the temptation of any power and any platform is to use that for your own benefit. Is to say, because I have money, because I care about my family, I'm going to use that just for us. Here we go. That's one of the reasons I think we get disappointed with politics. Because I think in general we have this hunch that they're not always concerned about the overall good as much as their personal good. Pray for our leaders. But really it's a temptation for anyone with power. From the CEO to just a parent on the school board, the temptation is to say, I'm going to use that for me. I'm going to finally have a voice on my homeowners in this organization, so ultimately what I want will go down, and that's what's going to happen. This is a common thing to do. It was so common that Jesus even says, this is what's going on in my age. He was teaching his disciples about what rulers do with authority, and at one point, he, he told his disciples, like, you guys know this, right? This principle of power. You know that when you have power, like the rulers of the Gentiles, they just use it to lord over other people. And you know that the high officials, they just use that to have authority over someone else. They use it for themselves. And that's exactly what makes this lesson such a head-scratcher. In fact, I really appreciated the beauty of the Holy Spirit inspiring John as he wrote these words. And I want you to just consider these words. So, first was written. All right, John, if you could go to that slide, the next passage. My clicker's down. Boom, nice. All right, so, so get this. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and they had come from God and was returning to God. So basically, this is saying at this point, Jesus has all authority. Okay? He's right now at the right hand of God. There, there's nothing above him. He is above every power, every opportunity, everything. And so it would naturally follow. And so, because he has all power, he snapped his fingers and he wiped out his enemies. That would be expected. And so... He commanded his disciples to do whatever he wanted them to do because he was in charge. And so he did whatever he wanted because, well, he had the permission and power to do that. But it's not what it says. Next slide. And so 
He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. That's unexpected. That the one who now stands as king of kings says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick the lowliest position, the position of servant. I'm going to make sure everyone knows what I use my power and position for. Thank you, David. It's a live presentation. (laughs) Well, as that's going on, I think it presents an awkward situation kind of like this. Have you ever done a dance with someone at a doorway? Because you weren't sure in politeness who to go first. And you end up dancing in the hallway or dancing in the doorway. Um, It's something awkward. And we see that awkwardness also. Thank you, David. Can we give David a hand? Awesome, awesome. There's this this thing that happens because, um, well, we're not sure. We know it's polite to let others go, but again, it seems awkward. That's exactly where Peter's at, right? Peter knows, like, Jesus, like, servants do this. (laughs) Like, I, I just feel strange, you know. Not only, you know, you washing my feet, but who you are. You are the Messiah. And I wonder if Peter was like, Jesus, I should be washing your feet, if anything. And so he says, no, no, I should never wash it. But Jesus enters into that awkwardness. He says, you don't understand, but what I'm doing is so important. You need to understand this principle. What I'm demonstrating is more than the social norm. And it leads us to our next takeaway. That if we are to be servants of Christ... Becoming a servant means using your power for the sake of someone else. The one who had all power, all authority, everything was under him, and he washes feet. So what does this mean? Cool teens. I know there are cool teens here. Has God given you popularity? Has God given you a friend group? Guess what your opportunity is? To use that for the overlooked, for the kid who needs a friend, to be nice to those who would be surprised that you're being nice to them. Business people, has God given you a position? What is that for? Is to go into that workplace and say, this isn't just about me getting my name known or getting the next promotion, it's me helping you and helping the organization. Married people. When it's so easy to neglect the person that we've said, I want to do life with, you are my second after God. To go back to a marriage and say, man, you go first. In every which way, not just at doorways. Whatever platform God has given you to empty yourself of that and use it to serve those around us. That's the goal. That's the goal. And so your next step is this. What is the most important area of your life right now where you need to say you first? Maybe it is that boss who's going back to the workplace and looking at that employee. Maybe it is that teen or maybe a sibling who's looking at a brother or sister and saying, I'm going to do better to get along. Maybe it is that spouse who's saying, no, I've been for too long neglecting you first. But this is a struggle. This is hard work. In fact, I wanted to explain the context of Jesus' teaching to his disciples. When he was referencing how others use authority, you know what had just happened? James and John had just come up to Jesus with a request. And James and John, they said to Jesus, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. The humility in that statement, right? (laughs) And basically, like, you have the power, you have the position, guess what you should use it for? For us. We're going to sit at the right and the left in your kingdom. We're going to have power too, so we can exercise that power over other people. This is where Jesus is like, no, 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 no. This, this is not how it goes. He says, this is what's common, but not so with you. We got to do it differently. But just bringing up this topic, and I don't know where it lands... It identifies the fact that we are still struggling with our sin. Do you see it? To the day we die, we're going to be wrestling this principle to the ground. 
And we're still going to fall short. And so never forget why we've gathered on Sunday morning. We've not gathered primarily as a pep talk for morality. We've gathered for a Savior who's so much better and so much more beautiful than we are. A Savior who in his service to us, his head was crushed and his hands were pierced. A Savior who would do so much more than wash feet. He would be betrayed, denied, tortured, and crucified. And consider the position of God. Jesus is true man and true God. And if he was only true man, he couldn't save the world. If only as true man, he lived a perfect life and died, he could maybe get to heaven himself, but he wouldn't rescue us. But he used his Godhead so that when Jesus died, his sacrifice could save the world. It could be the ransom not only for, for anyone's sin, but for all sin. The atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. And so Jesus did not use his Godhead to his own advantage, but for our advantage. So that we could be set free. And by the way, you are. You're set free today. Jesus has forgiven our sins. He has forgiven our selfishness. And he still wants us. He still loves us. But there's still an opportunity. See, we have the rest of our lives to live with the goal of giving him great glory. And if we implemented this simple principle, oh my goodness, would it change the world. And I need to talk a little bit about what this would look like, the implementation of servanthood. So I mentioned before it's spring break, and I wanted you to consider a hypothetical situation. I wanted you to imagine that there is a dad who loves to watch baseball. Any dads like that? Anyone in the building? Yeah. And so dad has a great idea. And dad's idea is we are going to go to every baseball stadium possible, starting with Fenway Park, maybe New York Yankees. We're going we're gonna to do a, a tour of the baseball stadiums. As you imagine that, also imagine a family that hates baseball. Like, they have girls. And the girls don't watch sports. They're just there for cotton candy. And a wife who, you know, will put up with baseball but calls it long and boring and those kind of things. Now, if you have such a dad, would becoming a servant be taking your whole family on this trip to tour baseball stadiums when no one else is into baseball? No, it would not. All right, moms, I'll do a mom illustration. What if mom loves the beach? salt and the sand and the crashing of the waves. But everyone else hates being dirty. And dad hates vacuuming out that sand from the car. <laughs> Would it be kind if the only goal of spring break was to go to the beach every day, not recognizing that the only one having fun is her? No, we're not. Birthdays. Let's say a husband buys golf clubs for his wife. Hey, babe, here's some clubs. I don't golf. Well, you can now. <laughs> These are not the principle. The opposite. We understand that. We understand that to be mature adults is trying to, again, serve one another. Now, let's take this conversation further. Something that I really caught on to was the end passage that I had you say. The end passage says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you continue to know them. Is that what it says? You'll be blessed if you have conferences about knowing more about them and talk about them with your friends and pray that your other Christian friends would do these things, but not you. You just know them. You're picking up on my sarcasm? No, you'll be blessed not only by knowing them, but by doing them. And that is a careful differentiation when it comes to spiritual maturity. See, one component of spiritual maturity is knowledge. I would call that out. You need to have an understanding of the Bible. You have to have an understanding of the big narrative of the Bible. That is part of maturity, but it's not the only part. The other part is that whatever you hear, you've got to do. That's what makes us spiritually mature. That's what makes us like Jesus Christ. 
not just holding conferences and Sunday mornings where we talk about the things of God but never actually do it. But when we go out and we say, you said it, here I go. And this could change the world. If uh, dad had a spring break and the guy loves baseball and yet listens to his family never going to a baseball stadium because he wants to do what they want, that's a good dad. And a mom likewise. Because it's an opportunity to show love. You know, this dynamic came up in this movie called Jesus Revolution. I don't know if you've heard about it. Jesus Revolution. And uh, it was a movie about reaching out to hippies with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there were some church people that said, you know what, we can't reach out to hippies. Their culture is so unlike church culture. What they stand for is so unlike what we stand for. And there's a scene in the movie where the church people kind of revolt against the new people who are coming to church. In fact, after seeing the hippies in their church, some of the leaders go up to the pastor and they say, you've got to stop that, you've got to change that, you've got to tell them to go. Because their style of clothes is different, their music is different, the way we do worship is different. And the pastor rightly said these words. He said, I'm not sure it's my job to make you comfortable. I'm not sure it's my goal that you would continue in this way, not knowing what they need. Because servanthood is about knowing what someone else needs. You know, as a leader in the church, graduated from seminary, and I now know why I needed that sermon. Because not everything I had to do was comfortable. Sometimes I had to speak up when I'd rather have been silent. Sometimes we needed a change where it would have been easier just to let things continue. But I was compelled by the voice of Jesus and still am. Because Jesus said through the words of Paul for church people, I have become all things to all people. So by all possible means, I might save some. And if you're in Christ, you need to consider this verse as your way of outreach, of sharing the gospel. Have you tried to become all things, putting down your way? Have you tried to use all means or are there... Things that you say, oh, I can't use that mean. It's too much. It's a sacrifice. You know how uncomfortable I'd be if I used that means? Paul says, no. No, no, no. What's so important is sharing this gospel message. We need to consider it all. And we'll do anything short of sin to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know... Amazing Love just gathered for our leaders retreat and we planned a year of ministry and I'm excited about it. And what I love about our leaders is that they've caught on to these principles. In fact, in our leadership, everyone knows this phrase that, that a certain person says that we need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. I like that. As leaders of the church, we need to be comfortable being uncomfortable because that is spiritual maturity as we continue to try to reach whoever with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so if you're taking notes, here it's put it pointedly. I don't believe you can claim spiritual maturity and also say, I'm not bending. <laughs> it's got to be me. I got to be comfortable. No, spiritual maturity will always say, what can I give up so that you can be helped? That is how we become leaders in the church. But there's something else that struck me. And to talk about it, I, I talk, heard some news about uh, this character, Dennis Rodman. And uh, it was released recently that Dennis Rodman was known from whenever he'd go to Boston, that he would buy out the Toys R Us, and he would give all the presents, all the gifts, to the children's hospital in Boston. That's the rumor on the streets. Every time he went to Boston, he'd buy out Toys R Us and give those to someone else. I was like, wow, that's incredible. I heard from another celebrity, Shaq, that his way of tipping someone was saying, well, what do you want as your tip? And sometimes that has led some people to say, well, I want a couple thousand dollars. Well, that's shocking to me. Extreme to me, not common to me. What also is shocking to me is this passage. 
It says, having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the very end. And why this is shocking is because what it requires of Jesus. See, up until this point, things were not as hard as they were going to be. Yes, he fasted for 40 days and was tempted by the devil, but he never sweat drops of blood about that. Yes, he was hated by the Pharisees and they wanted to push him out of the cliff, and yet he got through that okay. What he has to do next causes a great deal of pressure, a great deal of emotion, as he would suffer and die in our place. And it's so unexpected that even the disciples couldn't make sense of it. The disciples were like, I I don't understand how your love could allow that. And yet this is what servanthood is all about. It's not doing the bare minimum. It's going to extreme lengths, going to unexpected lengths, surprising and shocking the world. And if we want to get this lesson right, I believe becoming a servant is about going further than what most would imagine, further than what is common, giving more, sacrificing more. In fact, consider these words of Jesus and Matthew. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hire the best lawyer and make sure you don't lose. Nope. Hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Jesus says, don't just do the bare minimum. And yet I wonder, where are we just giving the bare minimum? Do you go to a job just waiting for the the clock to ring and for you to punch out, rather than asking, how can I most benefit this organization that I'm called to by my vocation? Do you go into a relationship with someone who's hard to get along with and say, well, I'll put up with them today, versus trying to pray for them and sacrifice for them to try to understand what makes them tick? Do you fall into that trap of marriage where neglect is also common, not remembering your vow and the commitment you gave to put them on the same platform as Jesus Christ, to serve them because Christ served us? What would it look like for you to go the extra mile? That's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't give up or give in. What I love about loving us to the end is that his love was not lip service and good intention. His love was not a conference about how I'm going to love you. His love was action. And he went from washing feet to getting his feet nailed on a cross where he would die. And what we know is that the salvation of the world is the ultimate you first declaration. Because of that, we're set free. And because of that, we have peace based on his performance and not on ours. And so Christian, church family, brother and sister, what does that look like for you? May God so lead you. May God so bless you. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends our understanding, may it guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. You know, at this time, we have the opportunity just to confirm that we are in community with one another. Uh, We're in community and we confess a common faith. So if you're comfortable, feel free to join in in this common Christian declaration. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.